All right. Well, welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, again, we're going to do a quick AV check for all those of you who are just joining in. Uh, those of you who have already been around, no need to give us a second confirmation. Uh, today we're going to be discussing downtime prevention and mitigation strategies with SysG3. My name is Derek Wood. I'm the Director of Channel Engagement with Infrascale. Today we're going to be doing an introduction of SysG3 as a partner of Infrascales, and then we're going to go through downtime and why that's such a big deal. Uh, then SysG3 is going to give us a rundown of five primary ways to achieve zero downtime or get as close to it as possible. We're going to talk about ransomware specifically, of course, and then finish up with some Q&A. So throughout the presentation, uh, ask questions and we'll get to those as we can. Uh, also for your chance to win an Apple TV, ask a question to officially enter the drawing. So your odds are pretty good, better than most prize giveaways you'll get, you know, one in a thousand or so. Uh, and with that, I will let the principals and founders of Sister G3 let us get started. Hey everybody, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I really appreciate it, uh, especially during lunchtime here for us at least. Um, just a little blurb about us before we really get started. Uh, we were founded in 2004, as you can tell. Um, but the founders actually came from the Fortune 500 uh, space where we built data centers and technology buildings for our clients. And when we saw this market was severely underserved, we really decided to take the, the market. Um, what we found was a lot of players in this space didn't have the, uh, in, the knowledge really to cover everything that's necessary here. Uh, we found guys that are excellent at specific pieces, but not the systems as a whole. And that's kind of where we, we uh, really find our niche. Um, we founded the company on based on the principle of smart, not greedy. Um, and to that, we've actually kept that edict in our company for the last 13 years that we've been running this. And we've kept eight of our first 10 clients. And we've uh, stayed true to that. Uh, let's introduce Infrascale and how we met up with them. And really, we found them a few years ago because a client of ours was looking to back up a substantial amount of data uh, in for their operations. Uh, I believe the account was 45 terabytes. And at that time, cost and the ability to do it was actually sh pretty short. We actually worked with our clients, met with several vendors. I think I personally spoke with at least 20. And when we ran the Infrascale, uh, they were the first ones really that could really back up what they said they could do by showing us what they could do. And uh, fast forward that by a few years, we've built some tremendous solutions for our clients. Um, and we've met them both in functionality and in budget. And that's just us in a small capsule. And I'll turn over to Cameron to kind of go over the next few slides. All right. So with uh, Infrascale, uh, we've built a piece of software with the mission to really eradicate downtime and data loss. And the reason that we've made this our mission is because uh, you have the damages that incur upon losing something. But the cost of downtime uh, is, is really one of those things that has coattails for, for days. So it's not just what you lost. It's the time to catch up to where you were. It's the cost to fix, um, you know, all sorts of things come into this compounding effect of downtime. It's been estimated that about $700 billion annually, just in North America, is lost because of downtime. Uh, so this is a very serious topic. And when we talk about it, a lot of people don't understand the, the variance in downtime. Uh, for the most part, it's easy to think about you know, things like hurricanes, fires, floods, uh, these sorts of events. But from a statistical standpoint, these are really the least likely to happen. What you're typically looking at are things that will always happen, like hardware failure, uh, humans being humans and making mistakes, software failure. So the top causes of downtime are actually kind of what we like to call micro disasters versus these macro disasters where an entire business is wiped out or burned or whatever the case may be. And this is really, truly achieved uh, when you have somebody like Sysa G3 
who can take the expertise that they have in, in building systems and networks and apply a product like ours to that environment in a way where you can really minimize your downtime. And I'll pass it back to the Syzygy team to take us through their five ways to achieve minimal downtime. Sure, thanks so much. Um, well, you know, when we approached this market, we really said that the mission has to be uh, a simple overarching goal. Try to eradicate downtime or at least radically minimize it and try to do that in a way that is affordable and simple and that any company of any size can reasonably implement and feel that they are adequately protected. So that was really essentially what led us to partnering with Infrascale and putting together the kind of solutions and services that we wanted to. Um, in order to achieve that kind of result, it's not just one solution though. You need to really kind of bring together several different key pieces to make for an integrated defense protection and recovery strategy. So we can start to talk through a couple of those right here. As you can see, we have kind of boiled it down into five key categories. Number one, don't break the bank for providing this protection. That's really important. Uh, number two, make sure that you cover all of your systems. Very typically, and we see this very commonly in the mid-market space, people typically protect only critical data. So they look at what's on their servers, they look at what's on their critical applications, they protect those, and there's often a severe gap for data that is stored in remote sites, data that is stored on desktops, laptops, tablets, handheld, and with the increasing uh, amount of bring your own device type activities that are happening, that data is rapidly becoming more and more important and also more and more overlooked. Uh, three, make sure that you can protect against a variety of different kinds of issues that can cause outages. There are macro disasters where everything's gone, everything's off-site, power failure, flood, fire, building inaccessible, things along those lines. But actually more commonly, we see the micro disasters causing loss of revenue, loss of productivity for people where a single system goes down, where a critical machine goes down, whether that's a server or a PC, a critical internet connection that cuts off access to an application for a period of time. So you need to make sure that your plans address not just the big disasters, but also the individual things that can kind of hamper productivity. Uh, four, everything needs to be protected. You need to make sure that you're covering security for all those devices we just talked about, from the end user handheld devices all the way back through the stuff that's sitting in the server racks and everything in between, and making sure that you can centrally manage those things. Five, ransomware itself is a, a particular beast that's become uh, really problematic, really costly for organizations and has really ramped up over the past couple of years at a frightening pace. So that's something that we need to pay special attention to. Just go to the next slide, thanks. So number one, protecting your budget. The traditional model for DR and the reason that most companies have really done it for uh, enterprise level is because they've had to buy a second set of everything. You know, take your primary servers, duplicate them, buy a second set of them, drop them into a data center or a co-location facility or a second office, and then replicate everything between those two sites. Very expensive because you're basically paying for a second set of everything you need to run your business, but that second set of equipment is really not used 90% of the time. It also increases your overhead, it increases maintenance, your IT staff, whether that's internal or external, has a whole second set of things that they need to manage and make sure are functional. So for many reasons, it's a model that really costs and complicates things and honestly also puts, from a budgetary point of view, this kind of disaster recovery method out of the reach of small to mid-sized enterprises. So protecting all your systems. You really need to be able to cover everything from the handheld to the tablet to the desktop to the laptop to the servers to even the outsourced applications that may exist in the environment. Manage all that centrally from one place. Be able to recover documents, applications from any of those items and be able to do so in a timely manner. So this really shows the, the full ecosystem of the security you need, the ability to flexibly store it in a variety of cloud solutions, recovering anything from applications, from email, from databases, for full VM servers, data on tablets, et cetera, 
need to be able to support a variety of different kinds of devices that have different operating systems running on them, and you need to be able to pick specific points in time that you can fail back to, whether that's data from an hour ago, a week ago, a month ago, et cetera. So one of the things that I was just talking about earlier is where most people protect their data. You see at the top of the stack here, 90% of the solutions we see, especially in the small to bid market, cover their mission critical data and their data center in their core DC. That's where most of the solutions we see are focused, and that's where the most critical data is, so it makes sense. But it does leave a hole, and it's a hole that's getting larger all the time. People are opening branch offices. People are opening remote offices, virtual offices, home offices. People are bringing their own laptops, their own handhelds, their own tablets, and they're increasingly storing corporate information, corporate applications, and corporate data on those devices. So that's an area that we very typically see exposed and not protected in this segment, and that was something that we really saw needed to be addressed and one, was one of the reasons that we really loved what Infrascale brought to the table in terms of being able to protect the entire ecosystem of a company's data needs. So we talked a bit about micro and macro disasters, the difference between a full site outage where everything's down versus a single server being down or a single application being down. This shows essentially the solution of protecting everything, whether it's the servers, whether it's desktops, and how that protection works. So we see we have your primary site where your servers are, your virtual servers are, your desktops, your laptops, databases, applications, etc. The process that we have copies that data, dedupes it, compresses it, encrypts it, stores it on a local appliance that's sitting right there next to those servers in the same racks. Right there, that allows us to protect from micro disasters. So one of the VMs goes corrupt, or a server blows a power supply and goes down in the middle of the day. We have copies of that VM or copies of that server on this local appliance, so we have the ability at that point to spin it up as a local machine and recover from that micro disaster of that single system going down, or the CEO's laptop just fried and he had mission critical data on it. So we can easily go and roll back from the appliance and get the data that he needs, get it quickly restored to cover that micro disaster. Though for many people, the CEO losing his data probably isn't a micro disaster. Uh, from there, we go to how, how we go to uh, protecting it on the macro side. The entire site fails, we need to be able to bring that site up, bring the servers up, bring the VMs up, and recover all that same data, but not from anything back in headquarters from the cloud. So that data then is securely encrypted, transmitted to cloud, to virtual appliances in the cloud side, and we can do all the same things out of the cloud. Bring up servers, bring up VMs, recover data in the same manner. So having a multi-layer network protection solution is critical. In order to protect against things like the ransomware threats, hacking threats, data outages, you need to make sure that you have not just one, two, three points of security, but really security at every end. So you look at, from the outside in, your firewall gateway, you need to make sure that you're not just using standard firewalls, but you're using things that do intrusion protection services, intrusion detection services, deep packet inspection, et cetera. You get next to your user layer, where you have your handhelds, desktops, laptops. All those devices really not only need your antivirus solutions and centrally managed antivirus solutions so you can make sure that all updates are updated across your environment, but you also need the layer below that, processes and procedures, policies that get enforced to devices, especially to bring your own devices that say, if there's going to be corporate data on those devices, it needs to be encrypted. If there's going to be corporate data on those devices, password protections need to be in place. If there's going to be corporate data there, I need to be able to remote wipe it. So those policies and procedures become a critical point of protecting data. And then last, but the most important part is, even if you have all these things in place, things can still happen, compromises happen, data can be lost, how can you recover it quickly, efficiently? and get back up and running with a minimum of downtime. So that really kind of gives you the tiers of how your network protection and your recovery solution can eliminate those kind of threats when used together.
And I think for this final one, since we've been talking so much about ransomware, I'll turn it back over here to talk about the uh, scary threat that ransomware has become recently. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, we found with ransomware is that it, it's not just a typical virus that comes through and then after a few months, everyone kind of gets their head around the issue and then everything gets blocked and it goes away. Uh, ransomware is something that continues to grow every day. So it's an acceleration of, of threat, not something that's dwindling. So one of the things we built into our system was based on what we know about the types of changes that are happening on a system as far as new files, modified files, deleted files, uh, we can see what's uh, kind of within the standard behavior for a, a device. So what we've done is we've, we've added an alert that actually will tell you, hey, this is, this is kind of unusual. You know, Jan and Accounting just created 100 files today. Uh, typically, it's only about five or six. Um, then that would let you know that something is working on that machine much faster than usual, and that's kind of a common behavior with the way ransomware works. And this is included with the program, additional costs, it's just part of the monitoring system. And it's important that with ransomware, it is an all hands on deck approach. So if you can get a little help out of your backup system, that's great. Um, but you know, it really takes training your users, uh, as we had discussed before, as well as getting your network uh, security tiers in place, and then having a recovery plan. But it's really anything um, that you can do to help is is beneficial. And to go right into it, you know, what are the challenges with ransomware? And you know, we have the ransoms that are paid, of course, but really that's the least of your problems. You know, if you have to pay out $1,000 or $2,000 to get your data back, that's not gonna break the bank. But if you're down for a week, that could. First, a brief history of ransomware. It's not new. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. The difference of from what we've seen in the 2015 and 2016 launch is that this is the first time that a cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, has been used to actually connect the victims and the criminals directly together. And that's really one of the big reasons that this is a, uh, a growing threat is because the speed to get a return on investment uh, as a criminal organization, it's much faster than any other cyber terror or cyber criminal activity you can do right now. And it's, again, growing very quickly, which we'll, we'll cover in a bit. So who's a target for ransomware? Well, we, you see here, we put together a basic company profile and it pretty much fits everyone. Uh, the reason is because of the way that it it's attacking people. It uses very common phishing scams, emails, hijacked emails, uh, hijacked websites even, um, spam messages on messengers like Skype and uh, other. And it uses the end user to bypass all the security protocols that you have in place uh, to then get onto the network. And so basically we're looking at you know, anyone in the mid-market, um, anyone who has data that would be valuable. Uh, hospitals are being targeted greatly because, of course, it's not just uh, revenue on the line. If a hospital is out of operation, there are lives on the line. So there's a much greater incentive for ransom to be paid in that situation. But it's really hitting just about everyone. Uh, a recent estimate came out that, about, that over 50% of all businesses in the United States had been targeted by ransomware already. And it just, again, it just keeps growing. So let's talk about the, the numbers we have so far. So as of September 2016, $1 billion had been collected in ransoms paid from January to September of 2016. Uh, that's compared to only about 24 million in all of 2015. So you see a very huge acceleration in growth in this. And the reason is because one, phishing is still the easiest way to infect a network. You, know, you send a message or a file with something that seems innocent or something that seems reasonable like a hijacked Amazon order update email, which was a, a pretty common one. 
or even with uh, the iOS store recently. Uh, they can Ransomware can infect your network through mobile devices. Uh, it's not just limited to laptops and not just limited to Windows. Uh, there are variants for Windows, Linux, Mac. Uh, you know, it's really hitting everything. The, again, the trends that we're seeing in 2016 is one, there are no borders, so you're not safe because of well, whatever country you live in or what region you live in. Everyone's getting targeted just the same. They're going after businesses, and, and not just going after businesses, but the sophistication of the exploit kits in, before it activates, seeing what else you're connected to and spreading across a network. Uh, that's probably one of the, the most successful um, aspects of the evolution of ransomware to date. We have a little animation to go through. So we have ransomware and the skull and crossbones, and Mr. End User here. 2015, ransomware would get on your machine, start encrypting files, and then one day, boom, you get a notice like this. It says, you know, neener, neener, we have your data, pay us bitcoins, or never get it back. Uh, fast forward in 2015 to early 2016, all of a sudden, it starts looking at, okay, Mr. User, what are you connected to? So it's not even going to activate encrypting your files yet. It's first going to see what, what's going on and also who else you're connected to. So it'll, it'll basically move around the network until it finds an operating system or application vulnerability or network vulnerability. And then through its checklist of things to get access to before it activates are your critical apps and specifically network backups, which makes an offsite and cloud backup and recovery solution that much more important. So once it gets your backups, it knows that you have no option to recover and they hope that you don't have a cloud backup. And then they get your critical application as well, because then, of course, that's what triggers it all. And then, boom. One of the other things that we, br we brought up earlier was when people have, a, have their own laptop, and maybe they're using some sort of productive tool, like a think and share tool. These are, these are awesome. I think everyone, I use a couple different ones. Uh, but ransomware can be spread via these tools as well. So once that happens, Another Mr. User gets ransomware, and now it's nothing that they can really determine, right? It's from a trusted source, trusted file. Uh, it gets on their machine, and then the cycle continues. So it's one of those things where when you, when you do get hit with ransomware, you have two options. You either pay out the ransom and feed the beast, or you restore from a backup. A uh, recent statistic came out that only about 45% of the people that pay out the ransoms are actually getting their data back. And the reasons are because there are so many players in ransomware, there are a lot of really kind of low-end players where even, they, even though they give you the correct encryption key, their software just corrupted your file, so you're out of luck. Uh, others are just a little more malicious and you just can't get it back, uh, and, and there are some other reasons as well. And that's why, you know, you look at the number one thing you can do to improve the security of any system is to have a good backup. And that's where facing off with ransomware really came through with the partnership with SysG3 and Infrascale. And many may think, well, you know, I already have an antivirus. Isn't that enough? Um, and, and it's not. You know, an antivirus is, like we talked about, you have your... You know, it's like having your police department and your fire department and then trying to say, don't I need only one of these? They serve different roles and different purposes, and you're going to have things get through. About three-quarters of all ransomware phishing scams make it through email filtering tools. So it's just one of those things where you really need to have a one-two punch. It's your multi-layered network security, you know, your outer perimeter, your inner perimeter, um, and even user training as well as your ability to back up and have a good DR system for both micro and macro situations. So you get hit with ransomware, what should you do? Again, one pretty typical for any, any type of um, malware issue is you isolate the problem. Get the machine off the network, stop it from spreading to other machines, uh, try to disconnect it from the wide area network so 
you know, maybe it, it's updating via the web. Um, figure out when you were infected. Usually you can figure out what variant you have once you see the message and then you can kind of look up the file extensions. Uh, and then there are various tools out there that'll help you figure out when you were infected. If you were using our backup system, our anomaly detection system would actually show you a big you know, red alert saying, hey, this is when something weird started happening. So with our system in place beforehand, if it, even if you didn't see the warning before you got the message, uh, it'll help you figure out when you were infected a lot faster than not having it. And then you gotta roll back to a previous image. So it's all about having the right type of backup. And a lot of systems may not let you do it. So a lot of systems may have, especially when you're talking about full system, full DR backups and recoveries, they may give you, you know, the last 30 days or the last 30 versions. Uh, but with ransomware, when some of the variants have incubation periods as long as six months, uh, that may not be enough. You know, if, if the only backup system you have is from yesterday, then you have no recovery point that's valid meaning you have no recovery point, meaning you better hope that you're not one of the 50% that pays out the ransom and doesn't get your data back. So having the ability to have a long retention policy, no additional cost is really quite a, a solid benefit when you're talking about ransomware. And then we get into a bit of, you know, what's, what's this DR in DRAS versus backup? Well, in short, Backup is designed to make sure your data is safe, typically at a, um, at a more granular level than a full system. But it means that before you can recover, you need a recovery point to be set up. So you need to be able to first you know, download your backups to some, some machine, and then you have a point where you can get it up and running again. Uh, and that could be hours or days, depending on the type of system we're talking about, and if you need to go by hardware, or whatever it is. Well, with DRAS, especially our cloud-enabled DRAS, when something goes down, you right-click the machine that went down, and you hit boot. And within 15 minutes, it's going to be up and running in our cloud. You didn't need to provision anything. You didn't need to download anything. Uh, there was no boot disk fun. Uh, it was just a right-click and go and now you have access to your machines at whatever point you wanted. And then when you're ready to restore it to a production environment, you can do that as well and not lose any time between now and then. So the difference is the ability to stop your downtime ticker much, much faster. And, and that's what we're trying to do is bring DRAS down to the, to the mid-market. And I'll pass it back to the SysG3 team to take us through kind of the evolution of data protection and DRAS. Thank you, Derek. Um, well, the evolution of uh, data protection starts in the early stages where we did tape backups. We might have two, three, four tapes that we rotated through. Uh, we might have an off-site tape. We might have another tape that's uh, sitting in a safe on-premise. Um, Again, that's just a backup and uh, restoration of that tape backup uh, when you had a disaster and lost your data uh, typically took a long time to rebuild. That moved to the cloud backup scenario. The cloud backup scenario, um, easier to manage, easier to run, uh, followed by disk backup as the price of disks came down price of uh, storage came down. Uh, we're now copying disks from one disk array to another. Uh, also made it a lot easier and simpler uh, to manage. Um, from there, we go to a second site failover. Second site failover is a very costly and complex scenario. You have to completely replicate the hardware, completely replicate the, the access. Um, interaction between the two facilities usually uh, requires a, a high bandwidth capacity circuit and um, the, the cost is incurred to for capital expenditure uh, to configure up something like this. 
And then we move into what we're offering, disaster recovery as a solution. This is a real push-button failover. Um, very inexpensive to roll out because there isn't a capital expenditure. Uh, it's, it's, it's a flawless solution um, where you have an appliance on site that's replicated in the cloud. And when you need to recover, recovery could be in, in minutes. So Syzygy 3 is in a position to uh, help you protect your budget, protect your systems, protect against micro and macro disasters. We can offer a multi-layered network solution. We can help you protect against ransomware. Um, we're in a position for uh, a free evaluation. You can contact us anytime. Uh, we'd be happy to engage with you and talk about what the solution may be for your business specifically. So there's some frequently asked questions um, that most companies ask, what is the source of your environment? Um, Windows, Linux, VMware, Hyper-V, they're all supported. How secure is this solution? Well, there's end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, we can't see the data that we're storing for you. There's site-to-site -site VPNs, um, and we could even integrate with an MPLS network. Uh, what's the SLAs? Well, we, we can do this in 15-minute failover guarantee with an on-site solution. Um, we could we could offer this. The scope of our failure, uh, how it's orchestrated, the failover is a, a single server, full application, or an entire site. We can do all of those type of um, recoveries. Uh, up to 200 machines can be done in a parallel environment. What else is there to buy? There's nothing to buy. It's a total solution. It's offered as a service. All the software, all the hardware, the network and the data center are all part of the solution. So we're fielding additional questions. If you want to type into the chat, we'll be happy to answer them. All right, thanks. And I do have one question. Uh, do I need to buy different licenses for the granular recovery versus the full DR? Cameron or the service itself. Okay. Yes, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, licensing is based upon some of the requirements that you have in your environment. Um, there is different costs depending on what you're looking to back up and how far into your environment and what the recovery looks like. So absolutely. Uh, let's talk about your environment. Give us a call. We'd love to kind of get to know the details and let you know what it looks like. All right, great. I got another question. Um, Looks like a question about tape backup. Uh, do you, this is for SysG3, uh, we're coming off of a tape backup system. Do you offer any, any services or what kind of experience do you have in moving from tape to something like this? Uh, actually, that's an environment that we work in quite a bit where people have been doing tape backups. It's uh, something that's tried and true for them, but what they find is that uh, in times of emergencies, tape is only about 40, 46% reliable, meaning the rest of the time it actually doesn't work. No one bothered testing them. Uh, we've actually worked with our various clients to transition off that system uh, where they're able to, not one, save costs on the overall uh, investment that they put into the, uh, the tape side, uh, being the machines, the tapes, the time, even the off-site services that they use. Uh, we've increased the recovery times as uh, tapes are typically very slow to return. Um, and if it's off-site, you just wait for somebody to deliver them. Uh, typically what we find is when we replace those solutions, when you really dig in deep to what they're spending on the total cost of the tape side, uh, this, this solution comes up to be less expensive, faster, and with a much greater retention time. Terrific. I got another question from Brian. Does the physical location of the systems being backed up influence the price? For example, we have equipment overseas that we may we may want to back up in Asia. 
Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, the whole point of uh, technology today is that all, all technology is getting more and more geographically diver, uh, dispersed. So uh, that's just the world we work in. Um, the only difference then is depending on what you're looking to secure and back up might require several um, appliances, depending on location and bandwidth. But again, uh, the hardware is not a cost. Uh, it's a subscription service, and we work with you to figure out what it is you need to do, what's the best way to do it for you. Terrific. And again, another question from Michael. On servers, do you basically ghost them? We do not. Um, basically what happens is within the, the software itself, um, depending on what you're running as your server operating system, um, and this goes for both uh, Hyper-V, VMware, um, physical servers, you kind of name it, we kind of work with it, uh, where we actually take the information, we do back it up, and then we actually do do some deduping on our back end to save uh, processing time, um, the requirements of hardware, the load on your network. Um, so it is not the same as ghosting. It is a proprietary software that we do use to make it one faster, smoother for everybody involved. Right, and uh, just to comment on that also, if, if you had a machine that went down, and let's say you, you weren't sure, let's say it was ransomware or something, you could actually simultaneously boot different versions of that machine as well, so you can work on those to figure out what you're looking at. Uh, okay, another question. What bandwidth would you recommend or is required for approximately five terabytes of data? I think the uh, the answer really depends on what that data is. Uh, what we find in uh, many of our environments is that five terabytes can consist of uh, single, several single sources of large chunks of data versus um, thousands or possibly million pieces of smaller data, and that actually all plays into the equation there. Um, what we do when we engage uh, with all of our clients is really come take a look at what your environment looks like. Uh, we peel back the layers of what you're doing, and from there we figure out what it is that works best. Um, I don't think we've run into a situation where bandwidth has been an issue for any of our clients. Now, given uh, DSL or anything like that is not an option we consider, um, it's certainly something we do work with our clients on. Um, there is also a, a bit of land acceleration built into solutions to overcome some of those challenges that might exist in the environment. Right, and we, and to talk on the Infrascale part, we actually do have a proprietary uh, deduplication method that's used during transfer, which is uh, unique to us. And that means that after the initial backups, even if you're doing you know, 10, 15, 40, 50, 100 terabytes of uh, data total, the subsequent backups are very, very fast. Um, and it, and we, we haven't run really into any bandwidth limitations aside from you know, a dial-up, but now everyone can get, you know, at least a 3G or 4G connection, which which would handle a lot of it. And there are options to actually just send the first version over if it's a concern of yours. Um, oh, and specifically, okay, we got more detail. Hyper-V machines. So that's an environment that is is really nice to to back up a lot of data for. So you're not going to have a problem. Five terabytes of uh, any virtual environment is is going to be is going to be fine. All right. Now next, I just want to add, oh, go ahead. I want to add that you know in recovery you don't need that significant bandwidth because you're not bringing back all of that data that you stored in the cloud. With, as with other solutions that were like cloud backup you're recovering from the cloud uh, back to your premise. And uh, in that scenario, you need more bandwidth. But in, in our configuration, you don't, because you're not bringing all that data back to recover. That's a good point. Good point. OK, so we have, we have time to stick around. It looks like we have a good uh, number of questions going on. So those of you who have more, go for it. Uh, those of you who don't, no worry. And we will be sending out a recording 
of the whole webinar to everyone who attended today, so you can take a look at it later for reference or send it to somebody else. Um, but I think we'll just keep going down through some of these questions. I have a question here from Tom. We have our own hardware. Do we? How does it work with with your draft solution? Do we have to buy your hardware, or can we use our own? Well, let's let's G three take that. Well, it's not a it, it's not a hardware purchase. It's it's a it's a service, and the appliance that uh, is included in the service uh, cannot be replicated on on your own hardware per se. See, in in the fact that it that it is a service and we're supporting it. Okay. Um, another question here. Oh, go ahead. I just want to add up that one of the greatest things about this uh, solution, honestly, is that uh, we're not trying to add another burden to your already overburdened IT environment. Um, a lot of services will require that you have additional appliance put on that you need to worry about, that you need to own, that you need to worry about sizing. Uh, we've taken that burden off you, um, where the hardware simply sits in your space, um, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's all, it's the responsibility of ours to make sure it's up and running, that it's sized properly, that if you do outthrow um, the generous allotment of data story that we provide, um, that we work on getting that upgraded so that it does not become an additional burden or for you guys to have. All right, okay, it looks like our last question. <clears throat> uh, about SharePoint, we have about 400 SharePoint users. Uh, do you have experience? Does this work for SharePoint as well? And do you have experience in SharePoint management? Uh, we do. Um, my assumption is that you're you're asking a question about on-site uh, SharePoint storage, uh, in which case that just really becomes a server for us to take a look at. Um, that again, the the amount of data you store uh, is in very much a great sense irrelevant to us as with the service that we're working with you on. Uh, one of the greatest things that we like about the service that we provide is that the local appliance may have a fixed amount of storage, but the cloud side um, doesn't have to match that. Um, so something that, that we like to call uh, spillover. So if you guys do outgrow that box, um, the cloud portion of it does not need to be limited by the same size of the box that's on site. Um, while we work on getting that updated uh, and upgraded, um, your data is constantly being updated uploaded to the cloud for backup. Um, give us a call about the SharePoint. We love SharePoint. We're a big fan of it. We do quite a bit of work in SharePoint. So we'd love to help you work out what you're looking at doing. Terrific. OK, I got another question. Uh, situation from Brian. Let's say I have domain controller backed up and changes were made while DRAS was kicked in. Would those changes carry over to our on-prem systems if and when they came back up? I'm thinking of long-term power outages we had in, on the East Coast, namely during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, absolutely. Um, one of the solutions that, one of the questions people uh, very seldom ask in looking at these solutions is uh, what happens when everything returns back to normal for us. Um, in the previous days, uh, what you would have to do is schedule additional downtime later on and kind of restore everything back to your uh, regional hardware. Um, and depending on how large the environment it was, that could be a substantial amount of time. Uh, what we love about the solution is that not only is the recovery uh, back to your normal operations uh, seamless and easy, the restoration is actually just as easy. Uh, we'd love to show you how that works. So give us a call. We'll schedule some time. We'll let you show you how that works. Another, another great thing that we've done in the uh, cloud boot scenario when you're you know, looking at a long-term power outage is if you if you picked your resources based on either the intelligent picker for best performance or you manually did it, if you want to change resources, it's really simple to do. You just right-click and you change the resources and it does its thing. Uh, it really takes out a, a good number of steps of what you would typically typically experience in managing like AWS. You know, I always had to you know power off the machine and just basically trash the whole machine just to define new requirements, and uh, we wanted to avoid that. All right, got a question from Michael. I currently utilize a Barracuda appliance with cloud control for servers in exchange. How do you differ from this solution? Uh, 
Uh, I think one of the biggest differences uh, in that solution, uh, honestly, is that uh, we provide both the local appliance and the cloud portion of it um, without the limitations of storage on the cloud side. Uh, I honestly, we, we know both solutions very well. Uh, the dashboard on this side of the house is actually a lot cleaner and easy to use. Um, we've actually transitioned quite a bit of clients off that solution in the past. Um, and we can provide some great references. You can talk to our clients directly to see what they decide to do. Um, the other flip side also is that we also do an SLA guarantee on the scaleover. Um, I have yet to see somebody actually put on paper that they'll do a 15 minute scaleover guarantee. Uh, so, big difference there. Great question, great answer. All right, I think we're at the end of our session. So any other questions, you know, call now. You see the number at the bottom of the screen, and you can get on and chat with uh, any of the team members at the CISG3 office, and, and they'll help you get set up and send you off with a good amount of information that you can use to, to make your decision. So we're not just talking about backups. We can talk about network security. Uh, you know, all of that good stuff and all keeping it within a budget that makes sense. Obviously, it doesn't make sense if you spend all your money trying to protect yourself. So thank you all for the time today, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, everybody.